let's start at the beginning. How how did this all come about? I mean, one minute you're at Tim Kennedy's house working on his book, and the next minute you've been in the Middle East and Afghanistan for the past seven, eight days. Yeah, I, I can definitely say that I never expected to be on a, on a mission like this. Um, you know, the, the Taliban just blasted through Afghanistan so fast that it put both our troops, our allies in a really precarious position. Is the Department of Defense surprised at how quickly it seems that the Afghan National Army has collapsed under Taliban pressure? Is is the military or the Pentagon or the administration, or everyone surprised by how fast the, how the Taliban has been able to move through parts of the country? Taking these major cities like Kandahar, Herat, Lashkar, looks like it's fallen. Can you offer any guarantee to the Americans and Afghan allies that if they remain there past the end of the month, U.S. troops will help them evacuate. Well, it's past the end of the month. Alicia, our, our focus right now is uh, undoing the work at hand. On July the 5th, in the middle of the night, the Americans left Bagram for good without telling the base's Afghan commander. This map shows Taliban-controlled areas in red, contested territory in yellow, and regions under government control in blue. The embattled government controls only the capital, Kabul, and the areas marked in blue. I can't believe the world abandoned Afghanistan. <laughs> Our friends are going to get killed. They're going to kill us. Our women are not going to have any more rights. It was uh, so frightening for me when I heard their stories. Like, girls weren't allowed to go to school. Boys needed to obey what Taliban told them. Like, uh, it was so horrible for me that when I heard girls need to marry at a very young age to a man that they don't want to. And that was just devastating. And then watching, just being like everyone in America glued to the news, watching the Taliban march across a country that had held U.S. troops for 20 years, many of whom took their, you know, had their last moments on earth occur there or left pieces of themselves there, literally and otherwise. And it was just devastating. Helping liberate those people and, and, and send little girls to school and all these things we did and it came at a cost. I mean, we lost so many American lives. I buried 15 friends personally that uh, served in Afghanistan. So it, it was always personal to me. To the community of people who either had lost a loved one in Afghanistan or whose lives had been forever impacted by Afghanistan, we had to do something to try to not only make them whole, but make it all count. Having uncles that were in Vietnam, um, both of them were texting me while Afghanistan was falling and painfully pointing out the similarities between the two. It didn't look like the government was going to be able to react fast enough to get people out. Our good friend, um, Chad Robichaud, had been trying to get his interpreter out. He had done 10 deployments with uh, this interpreter named Aziz. You're four deployed, and uh, it's kind of just you and an interpreter sometimes, and Aziz was his interpreter. He quickly became my teammate, and then my sole teammate. He and I worked together on hundreds of combat missions. More than an interpreter for us, he was our brother. He was uh, our business consultant. He ran everything for us. He saved my life literally three times. I, I knew that if I didn't personally intervene, um, Aziz would die. He was individually already identified. He was on the run. Uh, his days were numbered, and uh, he was going to die. These people are being slaughtered. They, we made a promise to them. They're being slaughtered. They're being hunted for the crime of fighting alongside our own military. For six years, I had been fighting to get this guy the visa he deserved, this SIB, Special Immigrant Visa. And uh, that process is only supposed to take nine months. To not be able to get him here in six years in a nine-month process was really disturbing to me. And he was getting desperate because it, it didn't look like the government had a, had a plan in place um, that was going to get him out in time. So he was he was planning a trip of just four or five guys just to get Aziz out and, and started making connections. For me, it was a choice of um, do I do nothing or do I save my friend's life who saved mine? Uh, I knew I needed not only help, but the right help, people that had the experience, but also people I trusted. Chad and I connected, we had worked together over the last several years, and I just said, you know, how can I help? While I was talking to Chad, Nick, who is here riding Scars and Stripes with me, is talking to Sarah Verardo, both asking us the same question of, can you go? Um, but more importantly, giving us and providing us the answer with, this is what we're doing. They were 
figuring out a way to land some planes into Kabul. Initially, it was a very clear mission, which was to go rescue Aziz. As we were putting the plan together, just to kind of pause for a second, said, hey, it's great we're going to go help Aziz, but I'm talking to this orphanage over here that's 3,500 orphans uh, that, that need help too. Why don't we help them? It's happening in Kabul right now. It's pretty bad. There's about 3,500 orphans stuck in several orphanages around the city. We don't think they're going to get out. Do you want to come help? So I bought a plane ticket. And I, I think there was another pause, and we said, I mean, we really have the right group of people here. We have the skills, we have the ability to do this, uh, the passion's there. Let's not just help this limited group. Let's help as many people as we can. Uh, interpreters and their families, women and children that would be vulnerable, Christians that would be persecuted for their faith, uh, these different vulnerable groups. Let's help as many people as we can. And so I started just putting together different lists and trying to help. We knew it would be a difficult situation, but we thought that we had you know, a couple of weeks to make real substantial change. And as these requests started to build and we started vetting these requests, um, resources also started to be organized. And so Tim and I just looked at each other and said, okay. Then we're getting on a plane. 24 hours later, tickets are booked. And we're boarding a, pl a flight to the Middle East. We get through all COVID screening and um, we arrive at the UAE military's headquarters for their officers, like their officer academy. We just jumped right into the rotation. There was no time for like, oh, we're gonna sleep, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna figure things out. Um, we're still in a whirl trying to figure out what everything is, where everything is. Sean Lee, who works for Sarah Verardo, um, he had already arrived in UAE and they had set up a forward talk. UAE is our lily pad launch base and our Ford uh, Tactical Operations Command Center. Nick and I were basically running the evacuation of 2,500 people from two cell phones and a laptop. Um, so we just kept working and working and working. A number of people in Congress, in the Senate, in the State Department, DOD, we're happy to have us. People wanted to help, and so it was just connecting people who wanted to help that would be effective at helping. Back home in the States, Sarah Berardo set up operations center in Washington, D.C. to process people that needed help, help vet people, work directly with the Joint Chiefs to make sure we're vetting our groups. Senator Tillis's team, I mean, it was really whatever we needed, they were, they were doing. They were legitimizing our efforts. DOD was legitimizing our efforts. We saw so many great people drop their lives and do whatever was needed. One of our team members had a personal relationship with the royal family in uh, United Arab Emirates. We thought, hey, let's ask them if they want to participate in this and help. So we asked for support. I got several Congress members on a call. We basically proposed to the UAE what we're going to do. And they, they had faith in us. They, they believed that we could do it. Our gracious host, the UAE, said that they'd give us one C-17 and if we could land it safely, get people on, save them, get it out safely, they would send another and then another. If we could continue to do that, they would send more. I knew I would be more of an asset um, working with whoever's on the ground. Nick and Tim are in Abu Dhabi and are like, can we do a kind of a, a quick call? And so I'm thinking, okay, we're gonna get on the phone and, and they're going to talk about um, getting on a plane, landing, loading people and going back. And they were like, yeah, we're gonna do a little bit more than that. Leaving the officers club, it is Joe, who was the, the originating contact for the UAE. He throws myself and Nick in a truck. We grab our bags, check my body armor, change my batteries in my night vision, change the batteries in my thermal imager, did a couple of tests in a new country with a new country code with my sat radio and my sat calm. Then we drove to the military airstrip. And shortly thereafter, we were on a flight from Abu Dhabi to Kabul. And Nick and I boarded a 737. A very weird, eerie feeling of getting on a 737 with no one on it besides the crew, which are all people from Afghanistan. And uh, the pilots were 
three pilots from Afghanistan. They asked us if we could get their families out, and we promised that we would try, and we meant it. You know, we got everybody's information and built a built a manifest and tried to get locations uh, and all that. And um, we went wheels up around sunrise to fly into Afghanistan. you've ever known about an air field is wrong here. I've never seen an airstrip as wild as <laughs> people are everywhere. There's no tower. It's like one guy on the radio running the airstrip. Just nuts. A crashed aircraft on the side of the tarmac. Vehicles abandoned. I mean, it is a mess. Plane lands, taxis, stops in front of ramp nine. Honestly, I was thinking how impressive everybody was, how hard everybody was working, um, and then how bad it was on the ground. Like, the media is not doing it justice. I mean, it, the humanity of it, like, you know, kids are sleeping on the ground. There's, there's, you know, literally piss and shit everywhere. There's very little food. Um, there's just, Mounds of plastic bottles. Nick hops in a side-by-side uh, -side with Sea Spray to start going and helping these people load onto this aircraft and start documenting what is happening on the ground. And I'm off to go do work. You know, I open the door to this up-armored land cruiser. Um, the four guys that end up being there are Sea Spray, Dave, Shanji, and myself. So our team was uh, comprised of uh, some of the best in the business in terms of special operations and extraction professionals. I flew over to Abu Dhabi. I speak French, Russian, Arabic. I'm a former special forces guy, and I'm a former army strategist and planner. So I thought I'd be in Abu Dhabi in an operations center helping out to plan. So I found myself on the runway with uh, Sean and Sea Spray for a couple of days, and then uh, we had um, Tim Kennedy roll in. Sean G's first question is, what, what do you need? I need a gun, I need some local comms, and I uh, need to know what we're doing. Sean G is Sea Spray, uh, who were already on the back team, and, and man, immediately, I think Tim was on the ground and walking and getting briefed and walking out the wire. The military was not allowed to go outside the wire, period. That was, that was the rules of engagement. They were not allowed to go outside of the wire. And the way the, the White House set this up. They took the NEO operation, the non-combatant evacuation operation, away from the Department of Defense and gave it to the State Department, which is not the way uh, things are supposed to be done. And so when that happened, the State Department treated the NEO operation in the airport like an embassy. So now the U.S. military can only support what's inside. They can't go outside and help people. Americans, something could happen right in front of them. They can't go outside and help. They can't go outside and get interpreters. They have to control that air, that airport. The way that you wage war, you have, you have kind of four different elements. You have diplomatic, information, military, and economic. On the ground in Afghanistan, all of those are currently being controlled by the Taliban. The Taliban now controlled the airport. You'll hear the you'll hear people say that the U.S. military did. Anybody that knows military strategy knows that whoever controls the outside perimeter controls that ground space. So anybody inside of that perimeter was there only because the Taliban allowed them to be there. Who's coming onto bases, um, how the military is gonna be screening, who's coming on, who's taking passports, like that's happening by the Taliban. A lot of people were murdered right outside of the wire by the Taliban to show that they can do it. Their version of crowd control was when it got out of hand, they would just dump a AK mag into the crowd. Soldiers used to shoot, shoot with their guns to avoid the crowd. But in between, I saw people dying over there. They got hit by the bullets. I saw them dying there. The ground was full of blood. I saw children crying over there. Mothers weren't at the time to take care of their kids, their small babies. I saw some of the babies fell on the ground. People were running on them. That was the most horrible part. Taliban cut a young man's head off 
we did the Marines to get the Marines to respond. Another team had a woman put on the hood of their car, and as the Taliban looked right at them, they just executed the woman on their hood just to try to elicit response. Just to be like, just, just so we're super clear about who is in charge here, I'm gonna murder this woman right in front of you, and there's nothing that you can do about it. This is, this is the Taliban I know, and this is the Taliban that is outside the gates of Hkaya. He took one kid, melted his ID card to his chest, cut his arms off, and hung him up from a pole so that we could see him. To bear witness to something like that, that normally we would have done something in the past and really not be allowed to, to, to do something uh, kinetic at that point wouldn't have allowed us to be successful in moving as many people as we did. It's unfortunate, and I think anybody that saw that happen is going to stay with them for a long time. It was probably one of the more traumatic things I've been through. I've, I've been in six or so conflicts and two wars. I have two combat infantry badges. I'm, I've, I've seen a lot of stuff. Refugees are innocent civilians. So when something happens to them intentionally, you know, yes, you have collateral damage in a war, but something happens to them intentionally, it really hits home hard. It's impossible to explain the, the level of desperation that, that people felt. I mean, you just think that the first couple of days when people were trying to hang on to the bottom of C-17s, that's desperation that Americans, like Americans don't understand that level of desperation. I don't, I don't understand it. Yeah, I think, um, I don't think the news captured it and I don't think people can really comprehend the environment of, of HKIA. So many guys that I know that have a tremendous amount of experience in combat and special operations and seeing horrific things all describe it as one of the most chaotic and horrific things they, ever, they had ever seen. I've never seen desperation like what I saw in Kabul, what I saw in HKIA. You know, the Afghans knew that we would take children. So if it was an infant, we would take the infant. Not that, not that the troops were trying to, but if somebody like climbed up the wall and handed, you know, a Marine or one of the 82nd Airborne guys an infant, they were taking it. Well, people got desperate. And, and to, so that you understand, it's like uh, people were, were crowd surfing babies. They were passing babies so that the babies could get up front so that they could then, you know, hand them to troops. And this was their best hope that that child might live. That their best hope was that they could beach ball a child forward into the crowd and that some soldier or, or airman or Marine on top of this wall could reach down and pull this child up. And this child would have a better chance at, at, at life than staying in Afghanistan. These troops down that wall, just having people beg all day, all night, to please get them out. And, and, and you know, if they don't get in, they're probably gonna die. And like some people, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what level of desperation you need to be at to do this, but there were people that threw the babies over the wall when Americans didn't take them. This is like a frail, small Afghan woman taking her infant child and throwing this child as hard and as high as she could in the hopes that somebody might catch this baby. Not realizing that on the other side of the wall was concertina, so uh, like there were some, some babies that, you know, that bled out on the concertina wire. Uh, and that's a, that's a, that's a desperation that you, um, but you can't, you can't put that on TV. You know, you don't, you don't see that anywhere. Um, and as, uh, as I'm moving past these gates, um, whether it's Black Gate or Abbey Gate or, um, you know, the UN Gate, those babies are still in the Constantino wire. And, uh, those women are still stuck out there screaming the nightmares and like the So everything that was outside of that lane, you know, like I'm focused on this with like everything. I'm trying to save a woman and her children, but off to like five feet away from me is a, is a dead child, you know, is a, is a smoldering, burning body and having smelled bodies my whole entire adult life, but then seeing it's a small one and that's the burning body of a child. 
that was lit by the Taliban. There's nothing I can do about it. That's already gone, but I'm still here. Uh, but there was just everywhere. Uh, the only way to effectively evacuate those who are most vulnerable was to go out and get them. I'll just say special, special units. Um, and so our ground team was essentially one of those special units that were allowed to go outside the wire. We were targeting specific individuals that were passport and SIV holders that were external to the base and needed to get on in a safe way. Couldn't necessarily go through the Taliban checkpoints because they had been working with the United States. The Taliban knew you know, which women were educated and could read. The Taliban knew who the Christians were. Like, these are all the targets. Back in the job, you know, we were communicating with these targets before we would pass them on to the guys. And, uh, you know, we'd put target packages together and we'd be talking to them and sending the information down to the ground team. But a lot of these targets would go dark. I would load aircraft all day in, in, the, uh, in the heat and then at night we would go out and grab people. Looking at this problem set, you know, it's really no different uh, than any other situation, you know, that, that involves a, a uh, mass movement. Uh, it's a logistic challenge but it's based on the same framework uh, of an Indian. So we go out to do a recon of a potential evacuation site. As uh, we approach the first spot, um, I see some Taliban overwatch positions on top of a few two, three-story buildings, and uh, those ob observation positions can clearly see pretty much everything in that area. We start exploring a couple more evacuation spots. I clamber up to this gate, and um, I realized really quickly that there's just one single bolt on the inside of this gate, keeping this gate closed from the outside in the Taliban and access to this big empty parking lot. This just has a bunch of these buses lined up and the buses were perfect because it provides cover. And then immediately adjacent to that were these um, retention, I don't know if they're oil or water tanks, maybe a kilometer of them. And then it moved into this urban um, albeit very poor suburb, and um, that seemed mostly vacant. This was a not observed portion of our perimeter for Hkaya. Nobody would notice some people moving through there, um, and there were people kind of constantly moving through there. So it looked awesome. They were just pulling targets through the wire all night, nonstop, and they were coming back in the wire around the time the sun came. Before leaving UAE, we kind of set up the five W's for initial link up. What proves to be the most difficult thing in the evacuation is link up. So we started building these packages of, of people with information to validate who they were. And that would build manifest and those manifests would get, uh, would get sent to the joint chiefs to get approved. There were some lists that were DOD approved, but not DOS approved. There were some lists that were DOS approved, but not DOD approved. There were some lists that were Pentagon approved, DOD, Pentagon, DOS approved, but not Taliban approved. Hundreds of names coming in that were being cleared back in the States. And then we had photos, their documents, we knew exactly what they looked like and where they were. So a night looks like this. Um, sun goes down, I pre-position at a link up location uh, where I, I say at the corner of this outside of this gate at this time um, you're going to do a far recognition and then once they get close they do the near security check maybe it's a pro word maybe it's a um, a secret phrase maybe it's a word that you have to slip into a sentence and there were lots of different far and near recognition signals that we were using and we were changing them every few hours once we had that near recognition signal then I need to confirm that the documents that you digitally sent to us were the documents that you physically have in hand. Basically the places where nobody would actually want to go, that's how they were bringing people in. And they had they had four different good route lines into the complex. Even pre-planned routes, as I'm like looking at a map and I'm having to go from point A to point B, I might set up one, two, three, four, five different routes to get there. Well, my life and the life of these people that we're trying to get out is on the line and um, figuring out 
multiple ways to get right back onto Hikaya um, proves to be pretty important. When they were crawling through sewage, ditches, gross, you know, literally through crap, uh, under, under, you know, uh, concertina and barbed wire, um, digging holes. Whatever it was, you, you had to use all the options at any point in time, because at any point in time, that could be taken away from you, just like they were. Sneaking past Taliban checkpoints, and then sneaking onto the airbase, and then through the airstrip to our hangar to be manifested for the next flight out. Let's say each of those takes 45 minutes to 90 minutes. Multiply that by the 10, 11 hours of darkness. Um, that's the night. I don't think anyone slept, um, you know, maybe an hour a day, uh, just moving as fast. It, it became a blur. The second day we got 800 people out, and then again it became a blur. We started landing more and more aircraft every day, which meant planes started showing up at night. So we had to take turns not only going out in town, but also there's no ground crew. So when a plane landed, you had to hold up him lights and escort a plane into the hangar where we had people. You had to make sure that the food and water was in the hangar. You had to make sure that people knew the plan. My phone would die like three times in a 24 hour period. Um, I know that I lost my voice probably like around August 19th temporarily just because I had I just didn't stop talking. I didn't stop collecting information. Sean G is off talking to thousands of people on his seven different phones that he's using. If you have the ability to help someone, you help someone. And like, I've always, I've always believed that so strongly. And so I was willing to use any ounce of political capital or anything I had to throw it at this problem, knowing that like, maybe this is like my one favor I'm ever gonna ask of this person in my lifetime. And now this is what I've been waiting for. Like. This is the time to use it and to do it. I'm able to make a far recognition, near recognition. Their paperwork aligns with the paperwork they're sent digitally. They were vetted, it's approved. I'm able to bring them in and behind them, as I'm bringing these four people, behind them was another 40 people that those four people had told they're gonna be able to get onto the base and maybe get out. And then I have to look at those other 40 people and be like, no oh, bro, <laughs> like, I can't do anything with you. Yeah, we're making differences as we're picking up pieces of sand and you pick up enough of them, you'll eventually have a bucket, but um, I'm looking at a beach and I'm moving a grain of sand at a time. We we're so focused on what we had to do that every, every one of those pieces of sand was a life and a life that fought for us and a life that deserved uh, to live and a life that deserved a better opportunity than, than what the Taliban was gonna give them. You know, we're a drop in the bucket. And every life that is moved off that beach and into a bucket is a life that is that is saved from indescribable acts. The command there, they started slowly closing down gates as the timeline, the clock started running out. Meanwhile, the base, plumbing, water, everything starts to shut off. Now it's how many people can we get out in the little bit of time that we have before ultimately that base crumbles. Finally, uh, as things were starting to get tight, that a whole lot of government agencies had their people still out there by name. We knew we were getting close to the end, so we, our team physically bought seven buses. We had a location for 300 orphans, we had a location for about 100 Christians, and then we had several high-value individuals that were requested by government entities for us to pick up. And then we also had the families of uh, the crews that had been flying the charter airplanes. We send out buses to multiple places throughout the city. The most elite intelligence agencies in the world have their people on these buses. Afghan special forces commandos, uh, interpreters, uh, Christians, orphans, all of these on these buses. The guys worked all night and, and filled those buses with those individuals. In one last swoop, we thought we could, we could just get one big, big lump through. We had this great little gate that we had arranged ahead of time with the Marines. We have five of them lined up 
at this spot, at this uh, at this one gate at Blackgate. I got a sack call. Hey, we got 300 orphans, 100 Christians, the HVTs, and the and the families of about half the the crew through the gate. We danced a jig, like we were like, you know, fuck yeah, like one of the happiest moments that, that I had during the whole event. Nick and I, uh, as the call came in that they were approaching the gate and that they were getting ready to come in, were high-fiving and kind of jumping around. And it's three o'clock in the morning. There's nobody else around. And we're doing as much as we can, as fast as we can, but we can't make mistakes. You know, we can't let one person through that shouldn't have gotten through. And uh, so we're being, we're being thorough. And we were talking to uh, one of the... Uh, government representatives, uh, and who was the regional representative for that agency. Calls are going up chains of command, and ultimately, um, the Fulbird Colonel, who is in charge of the base, arrives on on scene at Blackgate. There was a, a colonel who came out and wanted to show that essentially he was the one that could decide whether or not somebody could get on a plane or not. And uh, he just makes the call, turn everybody around, Put everybody back out. I don't care who they are. Tim calls on the sat phone. He's like, they're kicking them out. They're going to kick them all out. I got a message from Sean Lee that says a colonel from the 82nd is seriously about to kick out 300 orphans and Christians and American citizens. We had the appeal of these lists have been verified. They had been searched by U.S. Marines. They weren't carrying anything. Their bags had already been gone through. They'd been patted down. Documents had been verified. We had all of that proof. I think that one of the responses was, I don't know if that's fake or not. We are trying to talk sense into them. Can we at least go through all these people and make sure we pull out the American citizens and the green card holders? Pump the brakes here. Let's talk about it. He's like, don't, it's my decision. This is a command. I'm like, well, I'm not in the military. I'm not here for the military. Um, and uh, that's not really a lawful order. Let's Let's talk about this. We've seen fake documents in the past, and how do I know that these are real? I think my response at the time was, I mean, is it worth the risk of saying that it isn't? If there's a chance that these documents are real, are you willing to push Americans back off base? And they were. Like, is this an unlawful order? Is he just a terrible human being? I mean, what is happening? From his perspective, even though Tim wasn't the team leader, Tim was the only guy that he knew as I was walking away, I heard him say, this isn't Tim Kennedy's show. He thought, this is some fucking guy that's just showing up in Afghanistan, running seven buses in. You know, fuck this guy, I'm gonna kick him out. These were people that fought and had their relatives die for us. They lost their limbs for us. They lost their adult lives and youth and their innocence for us. Yes, they are fighting for Afghanistan. Yes, they are fighting for their people, but they are fighting with us. That's who is. That's who we're trying to save here. From our perspective, this was possibly the most valuable load of people we had brought in thus far. He had a West Pointer try to talk to him, like another West Pointer, which works a lot of the time. I said, "Hey, look, I'm a, I'm a West Pointer too. I've been to your school." I Trust me on this, we have the manifest. We need what he, he said, I don't care where you've been to school. I mean, it just went in one ear out the other. Just, just really didn't give a shit. But the next decision he made was just unconscionable. It, it embarrassed me for the army. If I have somebody with a blue passport, if I have an American hold up a blue passport, can that person get on a bus? If I have somebody hold up an SIV, a special immigration visa, can that person get back on the bus? If I have a P1, if I have a green card, I have a spouse of an American citizen, can these people get back on these buses? Like, no, I don't care who they are. They get back on those buses and those buses go back into Kabul. Get them off this base. Can we just keep the blue passport holders, uh, Tim yells, and, and he says, everybody goes back on these buses and I want them escorted back off the base. And the colonel said, kick them out. And at gunpoint pushed Americans, orphans, visa holders, back into buses and forced them back off base, knowing that we were already rebarring and cementing the main gates closed, knowing that we were gonna leave soon and knowing that if you push those people back off base, 
it was a high probability that they would not ever get on a plane. And then being told to go through the official process that we should take our lists of people that were already approved, saying that we should submit those lists to the State Department, who would then turn those lists over to the Taliban, and the Taliban would then verify those lists and determine who could come through and get on the airport, knowing full well that half those people already had documentation. Whoever just made the decision to turn those buses around essentially just killed, just murdered these people. And by the way, some of those people are children, and some of these people are women, but some of those people are Americans that we just sent back to the Taliban. Whoever got killed by the Taliban because of that decision, that decision was on him. And uh, I called Senator Tillis. Senator Tillis called multiple generals. Those generals called to the ground. But by the time the generals connected with the colonel to stop it, he had already kicked the buses off. Uh, and we don't. We did not see them again. Every Taliban around the airport saw them come through the gate on a bus with Americans. And now every Taliban member at the gate was going to see them leave and go back into Kabul. And that's heart wrenching. There's not enough emotional capacity left in my soul to be able to mourn four busloads of people that are about to die because the time spent in anguish and mourning is time that could have been spent trying to save other people. We continued to do what we had to do because we knew these people were counting on us. We knew that the guys, our friends who were at HKIA trying to help people needed us to do this work. The Afghans trying to get into HKIA needed us to do this work. So we put it behind us, we put our noses to the grindstone and continued working. Uh, and we worked for the rest of that day. I think back on it all the time, trying to think about what we could have done or said that maybe would have changed his mind. But I think, you know, I think he got off on telling us that we couldn't do something and that we weren't able to do anything about it. We still had planes landing. We still had people to, to put on. We still had hangars full of people. We still had things to do. The guys unwilling to quit tripled their efforts and worked and pulled out hundreds more people that night. Everything is starting to collapse on HKIA. Uh, people are breaking down, people are loading up, they're taking bulldozers and driving them over night vision. You see Marines with sledgehammers going into aircraft and starting to smash control panels to aircraft. You saw all the, the smoke coming out of different parts of the base because everybody's burning stuff now because you can't leave anything. Like the destruction plan started and it was just a super weird feeling where people started counting aircraft and figuring out, like, do we have enough? And at one point, we had uh, an Air Force officer walk up to us and ask, how many more planes could we get to, to see if maybe we had enough to get everybody out? And so when I heard that, I was just like, man, if there's not enough to get the DOD out, then there's not enough to get us out. Like, everything is starting to crumble and fall back to, like, this last Alamo. The only thing staying out is security. And one of those security checkpoints is at the Abbey Gate. And the Abbey Gate was one of the few places where um, if you had all the documentation, uh, the American government would vet and proof you there. And if you were on their list, you could come through that gate. There are offshoots, fractions of the Taliban. Name them whatever you want, ISIS-K, I don't care what you call them. It's the Taliban, it's just fractions. They're pragmatically organized, so the Taliban sent in a suicide bomber to that gate, an IED, and um, blew it up. The attack took place at Hamid Karzai International Airport in Kabul, Afghanistan. As a result of this attack, 13 of our nation's best and brightest are heroes paid the ultimate sacrifice in an effort to save the lives of American citizens and thousands of Afghans during the non-combatant evacuation of HKIA.
there's so much of their life that is left to be lived. So many things they haven't experienced, so many things they don't know. They haven't been married, they haven't had children, they haven't traveled the world, they haven't, you know, found what they're good at. They, they, there's so much they don't know. And, uh, you know, and now they're gone. And they were all kids, 13 kids, you know. And they were out there helping me, you know, giving people aid, helping people get through the wire, trying to do the right thing, trying to represent, you know, themselves, the country, the military in the best way possible. Like, you know, just absolute heroes. Bomb went off and I think that was, it was already just kind of confirmed the feeling that we had that it was already too late, that, that we were leaving. We knew that we would not be able to send another flight in and we wouldn't be able to get anybody else out. When the last airplane lifted out of Hkaya at the end of August, that was their hope. The United States ended its 20-year war in Afghanistan today with the conclusion of the largest non-combatant airlift in American history. I remember at one point, Sean G was still sending me names and this was like, right around the time we were learning that this would not be possible anymore. And he said, um, we, we have to keep keep making a list. And this is going to be a list of the people um, that we were forced to leave behind. And it just felt so haunting to put their names um, in these spreadsheets, knowing that we would have all kept going as long as we were able. And the choice was taken away. And we, we just thought we had more time. We were waiting on the ramp, the four of us are at the very back with the air crew. And um, as the ramp closes and the last little bit of light from Afghanistan finally closes out, it's, um, it's like this resounding gong of failure. I'm surrounded by hundreds of people. We, we, had, a, we had a woman that started um, fainting. And like, is there, is there a doctor here? 14 people stand up. All of them speak perfect English. All of them have worked for the Americans as doctors, orthodontists, and dentists, and orthopedic surgeons, and open heart surgeons. Like, they're on this plane. That, that's who's on these planes. These were amazing, educated, hardworking people that, that worked and fought with Americans. What our government did, the decisions our government did, cost American lives. It cost the lives of innocent Afghan people, and it made the world a lot a lot less safe of a place. I didn't have to go pull a baby out of the Constantina wire, but I saw it. You know, I didn't have to go and try to pull a baby up and over the wall, uh, but I saw it. You know, I didn't, I didn't have to go pick a baby off that was floating atop the crowd, but I saw it. But I was too busy, and uh, and that hurts too. Like I was too busy. You know, but like now, did that life not value more than this life? Especially when this life, this mission got failed or this mission got botched or the Taliban interdicted this group that I was trying to link up with and I never was able to make a link up and I just lost 90 minutes of time and I had to flex off to another operation. When I finally get there, I link up, it's the wrong person or they brought too many people and I have to tell those people that they can't stay. Like you either come and they stay or you don't come. Like those are, those are calls I shouldn't have to have had to make, but those are calls that we had to do at that time in that moment. And that was just unfair. It was kind of a bittersweet moment where we're like, okay, we got this many people out, but we all knew at that moment that as the United States military left, we knew for a fact that there were Americans still there. And despite what the news was saying, that there was a hundred Americans, we knew there was many more. I'm feeling as if uh, a bit conflicted, certainly, because you can't go into something like that and think that you're gonna be 100% successful. That's just the reality. From that moment in August, you know, meeting the heads of different organizations that normally would never have run into each other, whether it was intelligence organizations, different NGOs, commercial tech companies, it all worked in that kind of flash in the pan moment. And then months later, no one's even talking about it. And we're still trying to help in that in that uh, that arena. Everybody brought something different to the table. This perfect scenario of people all came together and converged at one moment. It's really, it really is terrible to get those messages because I feel like the world has quickly tried as fast as they could to forget these people. And uh, it's, it's not okay. I remember a member of Congress saying to me, 
what's going to happen? Like, we're going to be here and they're going to still be messaging us and we can't help them. At the end of the day, when you're getting hundreds of texts from people still pleading and begging and asking for help to get out, well, you feel as though maybe you didn't accomplish quite as much as you might have. We're still at it. I mean, I, I can say like, we're, we're not abandoning our allies in Afghanistan. We can't. It was sort of like we've got to just get back to work and figure out like what comes next. And so just to throw ourselves into like we're still going to figure out how to keep getting people out, even if it's slowly. Um, and also we're going to make a difference and really like set the example for welcoming our Afghan allies to America. There's so many people, I think, that are watching these events unfold, and, and that's it. They're watching it, and not many people realize that you can do something. When you go to Afghanistan, you go to Iraq, you go to war, you go to conflict, you go on a mission, you're being told to go. You're part of a volunteer military, but you're still told to go. So this is the first time that, that I think people did without being told, or actually told not to in some cases. Regardless of what they believe, regardless of where they came from and, and who they are, they were just humans helping other humans, you know, and everyone came together. There were some kids that were on one of the flights that I took out. The first time I saw them, heads down, no eye contact, very quiet, fear in their eyes, wondering, you know, who are these Americans? Who are these, these UAE folks? Are they going to hurt us? And then three days later, I see them again, at, you know, at the refugee camp, and now they're all running around and laughing and giggling in this, like, beautiful grass in Albania on the ocean. And then I looked up and saw all the Afghans, the kids playing, that was just fantastic. You know, not one was going to step on a landmine where they are right now. And it was like, man, like, these kids would still be in Afghanistan right now, but because of our group, here they are about to have a totally healthy, normal life. They get the medical treatment they need, they get everything they need, everything they need to be comfortable. That makes me feel whole inside. The seventh time was the first time we were able to get into the airport and that was the time that my, my, my whole life changed. Finally, I can say being in America is like staying in a very nice place. Like, it is free, you can do anything you want. It's a place full of opportunities. You can find what you want. You can do what you want. Like, like there is nothing going to stop you in here. There's too much to say about it. Like, I cannot express my whole feelings about staying in America. I've never been more proud to be an American in terms of more proud of my fellow Americans and maybe less proud of my government all at the same time. Every person had an obligation to do something about, even if they didn't know what that was, like pick up the phone, call your senators. I mean, the number of times I was just copying and pasting saying, when people are like, I don't know what to do, okay? Call your senators, call the White House, um, make your voice heard. Like, you know, this is, people's lives are at stake. People were saying, um, you know, I'll go to Afghanistan, I'll send my plane, um, I will sponsor a family, I'll do whatever. The generosity of the American people was inspiring and just something that I do hope stays on my heart and I remember forever. I mean, I can't name everybody that was on the team, uh, you know, obviously. It was, it was really, really um, inspiring to be with those people and to feel like we could make a difference. I'm as I'm proud of it as, I'm, as I am of anything that I've done in the military or since the military. I'm angry because A, it didn't have to be like this, but B, even after we got them out, nobody wants to help them anymore. It's not in the news anymore. Uh, it's not in the stream of conscience. We owe the people of Afghanistan more than we've given them. The people who were left in Afghanistan. I don't think we can ever repay what they've done because they've, they're have they left with the problem. Well, it's a broken world, a chaotic place uh, where there's always gonna be people in harm's way. Uh, and when governments don't respond, there's going to be a need for good men and women to step in and help. This crossed all lines. It didn't matter race, color, creed, religion. Nobody cared. Everybody came together and said, this is the right thing to do for humanity. And this is what we need to do together. What made you leave your family behind and go do this? 
Yeah, you know, America is supposed to stand for something. A lot of people took huge risks to try to make their country more like ours. We think about risk here, and we're talking about financial risk. We're talking about pride. We're talking about what other people might think. Um, and these people are talking about their lives. I was either going to be sitting on my couch tweeting about how this is all fucked up, or I was going to be, you know, one of the 12 people that was making it a little less fucked up and a little more American and, and, and what America is supposed to be.